Good afternoon, high places. You that are here and you that will join us by Facebook, social media. You can also go on our YouTube channel of High Places International and just watch over and over and over some of the, the programs that have been going on. We, we are so thankful. This is a way to reach the world. Yeah. We've had people from the Philippines, from the Middle East. It's just, just amazing. One of our ministry teams has been part of me for a number of years just came back from Israel, and they were watching us two weeks ago from Israel. So it, it's a blessing. It goes worldwide. This just gives the devil a headache. He cannot stop the gospel with it. Dr. Patricia is going to come, and we're going to pray over America. We all believe we need to pray over our, our nation. My God, we better pray over it. And then she's going to pray over Israel. We're commanded to pray over Israel. There's a blessing that comes with that. And then over the Ukraine, and strangely enough, we want to pray over Russia. God has people in Russia, yes. and we need to be compassionate about yes. that. So stay with me. I'm going to come back in just a couple of minutes. Come back. Thank you, Archbishop. Well, first we're going to pray over the United States. Here we go. <laughs> Father, we pray that you would preserve our religious freedom and help our judges be wise as a serpent and innocent as doves in dealing with legal challenges from the satanic temple. Yes. Abba, we need a fiscal revolution in this country. Father, stop those who are seeking to destroy our country from within by bankrupting us. Protect us from financial ruin and the consequences that come with it. Thank you for pouring out abundance on us and give us grace to steward it well. Lord, help us to steward our personal finances as well. We ask for your grace and financial provision for our personal lives and our nation. And now we go to Ukraine and I would ask you to please agree with me in prayer. Father, we thank you that you give the Ukrainian people an unconquerable spirit and support in different circumstances. Your word brings hope in the most desperate situations. We thank you for that. We thank you the World Bank has allocated $4.8 billion to rebuild <coughs> Ukraine. We thank you for the complete defeat of the enemy's plans and actions. Yes. We thank you that the liberation of the occupied territories and return of stolen lands. We also thank you for your protection of the civilian population and the Ukrainian military in the occupied territories. We thank you for blocking the chemical and other prohibited weapons used against the people of Ukraine. Yes. And we also thank you for raising more intercessors ready to fervently and faithfully pray for Ukraine. Amen. Amen. Now we turn to Russia. As discrimination and prejudice against evangelicals in Russia are rooted out, we pray for true religious freedom to reign. We pray for the millions who consider themselves Russian Orthodox to embrace spiritual change that leads to biblical faith. We also pray for a hope for the future found, not in drugs, alcohol, or crime, but in Messiah Jesus alone. Father, we thank you that you will bring your protection for those that belong to you in the land of Russia. Yes. Amen. Amen. Before we pray for Israel, I'll just give you a little bit of background of what's going on. Um, there's always something going on in Israel. Violent clashes have been being taken place on the Temple Mount between the terrorist Palestinians and the Israeli police during Passover and the Muslim Ramadan. This time was specifically chosen for this violence because it's a period of fasting and prayer for Muslims for the entire month. At that time, they believe they are closer to Allah and united in spirit. And setting these conflicts within holy time garners sympathy for them worldwide and portrays this as a religious battle. During Ramadan, there's always problems in Israel with the terrorists there 
Jerusalem Palestinians and it the Temple Mount each day throughout Sunday through Thursday the Temple Mount is open to visitors from 7 in the morning to 1030 and then again in the afternoon for a couple of hours I don't remember the exact time it doesn't matter what your religious affiliation is that you're allowed on the Temple Mount but Jews cannot pray. You can't pray on the Temple Mount, although I do. Uh, they can't tell. But they target the um, Jewish people because they have a very, they daven when they pray. And so this is very obvious to them. So now the Palestinian propaganda machine is portraying these visits by the Jewish people as storming the Temple Mount. And the Palestinians, you know, they put this out. And then the Palestinians, not knowing any different, are responding with stones and projectiles. And unfortunately, rather than standing strong against these attacks, the Israeli government of change, does that sound familiar? Headed by Prime Minister Naftali Bennett is intimidated by these threats. And so... He has ordered that once Passover is over, which it is, it was over Friday night, the Jews will not be allowed on the Temple Mount for 14 days, for two, you know, two weeks after this. And as always, whenever the Jews are attacked, it's always the Jews' fault. And we know, and they, they must pay the price instead of something being done about what's being done against the Jewish people. This all ties in with the Quranic machinations or secret plots. A Muslim cleric has determined, listen to this, that Israel will cease to exist on July 8th, 2022. Uh-huh. This insanity with the Temple Mount fits right into the whole scenario of what they're, they're trying to accomplish. So please, please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and peace within Israel. Yes. So now we'll, we'll start our prayers for Israel. Yahweh, we ask you to save your people, the remnant of Israel. We specific, specifically ask for you to save the new immigrants, terror survivors, and terror victims' families. We ask you to also save Holocaust survivors and families, elderly Israelis, Israelis in the IDF and their families, <coughs> medical professionals and teachers, politicians, drug dealers and sex traffickers, prostitutes, criminals, widows and orphans. We ask you also to look to those and save those in the various gay communities, the many settlers who love your land as well. We ask you to save multitudes of ultra Orthodox, secular <coughs> and traditional Jews. We ask also all the unsaved loved ones and the Messianic Jewish families come in to your kingdom as well. Father, we pray for the Jews in Israel who are unable to worship without facing threats and violence. Protect your people and guard the nation of Israel against Islamic ter terrorism and other threats. Since we're still in the month of Ramadan, Father, we ask you to reap a huge harvest of Muslims for your kingdom. We ask you to confront terrorists on their way to murder Jews. Put your terror on them and save them. We ask all of this in the name of your precious son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen and amen. Thank you for agreeing with me in prayer. I apologize for getting um, a little emotional, but these Muslims need to come into the kingdom too. Yes. yes. <laughs> God created them. They don't belong to him right now. But we can pray that they come in. And yes. countless Muslims are coming in. They're seeing Yeshua appear to them in dreams. And they're coming into the kingdom. Yes. They're believing a lie. So please keep the Muslims that need to come in to the kingdom in your prayer as well, as well as the others there. Thank you.
and may you have a week filled with much shalom. Amen. Amen. I have Muslim friends. <clears throat> We're not together a lot. But just a, a quick t testimony. I think most of you know we have a Bible college. <clears throat> it's been about four years ago, maybe five years ago. Um, <clears throat> we had an extension campus in, in Atlanta. And one of my sons in the Lord was running that. But a couple came in one Sunday <clears throat> to worship. And... Um, They've been hearing about the gospel a long, long, long story. But anyway, before they got there, somehow he found out about our Bible college, and this young man called me. Now, they were born in Islam. And uh, he called me and said, he's giving me his name, etc. It was the Arabic name. He didn't tell me anything about his background, but he said, we'd like to enroll in your college. And I said, well, that, that sounds great. Uh, what church do you attend? He said, well, we, we don't attend church. Uh, we're Muslim. And I'm thinking, okay, how do I deal with this? <laughs> Long story, they enrolled, him and his wife both, they went through our associate degree program, which is all basic Bible. They went through the bachelor program, graduated, went through the master's, but during the, the mid-term mid of the associate degree, when we were talking, uh, uh, I forget what the subject was, they both accepted Jesus. And then when they graduated the, in the bachelor degree, their parents came. Their parents accepted Jesus. Now, my, my point is this. Don't ever discount a small thing that God may be doing. He does big, big, big things. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you about something I believe is very important today. It's going to help us. Um, <clears throat> Father, thank you for your word. Your word is anointed. Thank you that I'm anointed to speak. And thank you my voice holds out in the mighty name of Jesus. There's many times in life <clears throat> when we go through things that we sometimes say this makes no sense. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> Six times this week, I got texts from past, uh, pastors. One was this morning. And they described what they were going through. And they said, I just want you to pray with me and pray for me. What I'm going through makes no sense. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me this. And I just want to respond back and say, get on the bus, Gus. <laughs> well, I'm already there. I understand <laughs> But there are things that happen. You don't understand why. You're questioning God. You know, we pray. Now, this is not negative, so stay with me, you that are watching too. We pray, we study, we declare the word. I know this Bible. I'm so thankful for 55 years. I have read it over and over and over and over and over and over. Sometimes an angel will ask me something and just to test me, say, well, where is that verse at? I mean, if, even if I don't know, I'll make it up. <laughs> no, all, all, about 99% of the time, I know right where that verse is, but it's because I've studied it. However, just because of that doesn't mean that everything changes for me overnight. Yeah. Things happen, and I wonder, why is this going on? Why is this going on? Even Moses, the one that led the children of Israel out of bondage after 400 years, and captivity in Egypt. He prayed in Psalms 90 and he said, Lord, how long? Yeah. How long are you going to wait and return and give compassion on your servants? Now, if Moses prayed that way. Something must have really been going on. He was going through one of the worst struggles of trying to get Israel organized in the wilderness. Now, when we've heard so long and we've prayed and prayed and prayed over the problem that sometimes God's doing something, obviously, we don't see. But if we're not aware of it, I mean, if we're not aware of the way we're feeling, we're not going to see the answer that he's providing because sometimes it's a little obscure. Now, God's aware of everything we're going through. I know we say that. I know we know that. And another thing, he knows everything you're going through, he knew it before you got there. But you might be saying, then why am I going through it? Sometimes bad decisions put us in it. Yes. Sometimes desires put us into it. Yes. That God had to, see, you need to understand. I think everybody does, but just in case you don't, God doesn't have any evil. He doesn't send evil. He doesn't give evil. 
And I heard a preacher say this years ago, and I thought, my, 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 where'd you go to school? He said, God employs the devil to tempt us to see what we're going to do. That, that's a double, I'm not stupid, I'm sorry. That's a double naked there. First of all, God knows what I'm going to do. He doesn't have to test me to see how I'm going to react. Doesn't he know this? He's God. Yeah. And secondly, he does not employ the devil. He fired him over 6,000, 10,000 years ago when he kicked him out of heaven, Lucifer, for trying to exalt himself above God. So my point is this. If we're tempted, if we're troubled, we're going through the thing, don't blame God. Just ask, Lord, how do I get out of this thing? Or how do I deal with this until I overcome it? Yeah. Now, I've taught this many times. I'll do it quickly. But... <clears throat> We know there are demonic forces in the heavenlies, yeah. in the heavens above us, demonic forces. And I'm not going to get weird on this, but I just want you to understand. They've been loose over every nation, over every country for generations. The reason that terrorism goes like it goes, the reason things go on in other nations that we see even in America, is because of the spirit that is in the atmosphere that influences decisions. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't always make our own decisions. We're influenced by them. Either we're influenced by God, or we're influenced by the flesh or desires, or we're influenced by the devil. Now, we don't give him any praise for that. But the point is this. These demonic forces are active in the heavenlies. There's a warfare that, that uh, John talked about it in Revelation. So we know this warfare goes on. It goes on to withhold your finances. It goes on to, to uh, block your, your breakthroughs of getting free. It, it goes on to prevent you from being successful, afflict you, destroy you, etc. Jesus said this, right, John, John 10, 10. He said, the thief, which is the devil, comes to steal, kill, and destroy but he didn't stop there. He said, but. Everybody say, but. Yeah. He said, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The word abundantly means this, life without measure. Yeah. Now, that's what he wants us to have. Yeah. Now, that does not mean that every day of your life, I wish it did, but it does not mean every day of your life you got a smile on your face. We have a dog that has a smile on his face every day because he doesn't have a hard life. He's fed, he's walked, he's, he just does everything he wants to do. But we don't have that smile every day because things will happen that will try to steal it. But you make a decision, yeah. I'm not going to let anything steal my joy. Yeah. Scripture said the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now Jesus told his disciples, they were complaining one day, and he told them, he said, I have over, there's tribulation in the world. There's trouble out there. And you're going to experience it. But cheer up. I've overcome it. In other words, I've made a way that you can overcome eventually, baby, every problem in every situation. Yeah. Now, in the book of Daniel, and I've talked about this before, <clears throat> chapter 10, <clears throat> Daniel was a prophet. He was an end-time prophet. The reason the enemy could not kill him is because many of the prophecies that Daniel gave and wrote down was from the end time. And Daniel was burdened for Israel, and so he began fasting and praying. Now, Daniel always got an answer. I'd like to be like Daniel. He always got an answer as soon as he prayed. Yeah. One of the verses that he stood on said, Before you call, I'll answer, God said. And while you're calling, while you're begging on me, he said, I'm hearing you. Yeah. So Daniel had prayed, and nothing happened the first day. Yeah. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. Daniel prayed the second day. Nothing happened. Made no sense. He did this for 21 days and thinking and probably saying out loud, this doesn't make any sense. God, where are you? What's going on? And while he's in prayer, if some of you have read this, an angel come bursting through the room. Angels are real, folks. Yeah. Yeah. They are real beings. An angel come bursting through the door and a little drama, but his feathers are all flying around. His wing is bent. And he said, Daniel, God heard you the first day you prayed. He said, but the prince of Persia, which is modern day Iran, he stopped me. The angel which influences Persia, he said, he fought with me and stopped me. I had to get help to get through. Then he gave Daniel the answer. 
Now, what I'm trying to say, and I'm getting weird with this, because too many people look for demons under everything. There are demonic forces that do rule in the heavenlies. You know, I was talking to somebody about this the other day. I don't recall who it was, but um, you know, I've flown for many years. I was flying one of our planes several times back and forth to Haiti. And a little bit north of this, we would go through the Bermuda Triangle. And I've had people on board that say, I don't want to go that way. And I would say, well, we're never going to fly an hour out of the way just so you don't want to go through the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had some weird experiences. Now, I, I'm not going to lie and make up something like ghost stories. But there's been times when just for no reason, the airplane starts shaking and the compass starts spinning round and around. GPS wouldn't work. Now, I knew what it was. There's a magnetic disturbance in that entire triangle. But my faith is in God and my faith is in the ability to learn to fly the airplane and my faith is in the airplane. And I've made it through every time. But here's the point. It was, the, it was what was in the atmosphere. Yeah. Now, Daniel had this attitude or this thought, this makes no sense. Why am I not getting an answer right now? It was spiritual warfare that was holding him back. Yeah. There is a spirit over Washington, D.C. President Trump used to call it the swamp. It was. That's, it was a swamp before it was dug out to even be the nation's capital. But there is a spirit that influences politicians. Young men and women with co courageous men and women, well-educated, beyond measure, go there with good intentions. And many times those intentions are overcome by temptation, are overcome by someone offering them the moon. And they turn out not to be what we thought they were when we elected them. But this same type of thing, it rules over territories. It rules over nations. Why do you think all of a sudden people just go nuts and they want to riot in the streets? Was it because of an incident that happened? Probably so. But there was an influence in the atmosphere that caused them to be that way. And now, have you ever heard somebody say, I don't know why I'm like this. I, I just don't know why I'm like this. Well, sometimes you're influenced by something that you've given place to. Hello? Now, here's the thing. I'm going to hear I'll get away from Daniel. Daniel did not resign himself to the cliche. Now, this may be offensive. He didn't say it is what it is. Now, that sounds good. That's a modern professional cliche. And it's okay. However... <laughs> don't settle with that other than it is what it is. That's saying nothing's going to change, so live with it. Uh -huh. You ever had somebody tell you, get over it? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. You want to get over it, all right? <laughs> 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 Amen. But it is what it is, yes. But if we develop that thought life, if we develop even that confession of saying that over and over, even though it's modern, it, it, it's popular, it's professional, it's saying nothing's going to change, so I've got to find a way to live with this. No, God did not design you and I to live below what he desires, which is his blessings. He did not design us or give us life so that we would live in a situation that just makes us want to get out of life. He didn't do that, amen? amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Daniel knew things were going to change. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. The things which we see, the Apostle Paul said, are subject to change. So everything you see, everything you go through, yeah. it's subject to change. Yeah. In other words, it will change. How do we change it? We beg and plead with God? No, but we use His Word. But let me hurry on with this. When Israel came out of bondage out of Egypt, and most of all of us know the story, they've been there for over 400 years, generation after generation. And when they came out, some of the Egyptians came with them to serve Jehovah God. And I don't believe Moses wanted this, just one verse of, of an indication, but they came out with them. And the whole time they're going through the wilderness, just after a, a couple, of, couple of months, Something's going on. They're starting to complain. God just set them free in 20 years of slavery. They, 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 in 24 hours, they received 400 years of back wages. Silver, gold, jewels, 
livestock, linens, uh, silks, everything was poor. And they had nothing before that moment. Yeah. Worshipped idols. This group of Israel wanted to worship God, yeah. Almighty God. Yeah. But now because there was such a strong influence of Israel being there for that 400, almost 20 years, educated in, in the Egyptian religion, the Egyptian edu everything, they were, they were just filled with this. But now here's this group influencing them. Remember some of you, remember the story when Moses went up on the mountain and God was giving him the Ten Commandments? That didn't just happen in the movie, that really happened. Yeah. God wrote the commandments with his finger. He didn't mean ten suggestions. He said these are commandments. Now while Moses is on the mountain for 40 days, remember that someone began to say, he's not coming down, he's been gone, and blah, blah, blah. And so they built a golden calf. Every one of them poured the gold that they had that had been given to them, and they made a calf, and they're dancing around this calf. Now Israel would not have done that, but it was the influence. My point is the spirit over that area and in those people influenced them to do what they were doing. Yeah. There was a group in, in the book of Joshua called the Jebusites. And they were, they were a, an evil people. Some of history shows that they were cannibals, yet they remained with Israel. Nothing Israel seemed to be able to do, nothing Joshua, who took over after Moses, Nothing they seemed to be able to do could get rid of these guys. And they were, they were so embedded in the culture, it started influencing the Israeli culture. If you read this and see these scriptures, you'll understand what that spirit was. The word Jebusite means this, to stomp on, to hold down, to prevent growth, to make others feel small. That spirit is rampant worldwide. You ever had anybody just make you feel just like you're a worm? <laughs> ever, somebody ever tried to make you feel like you're just never going to make it? You're never going to get out of this. You're never going to get ahead. And that rose over and over and over and over your mind. It's that same spirit that was there yeah. for 3,000 yeah. years ago. But you see, Jesus overcame that by the death on the cross. But my point is this. Understanding how these things work, then we will not say, you know, I just don't understand this anymore. There's things that happen in my life. There are things that go on that I don't understand why it's gone this long. And all of a sudden, pow, I wasn't even expecting it. There was. Over and over and over, he's done this. Now, when we walk this out, I've got a lot here, so I'm going to jump over some of it. When we walk this out, we push the devil back. Often unexpected storms come. Now we have a little bit of warning when tornadoes come. Yeah. Now we have a lot of warning when hurricanes come. Yeah. And it seems like the news media every year for Florida, they're trying to prophesy to get us to have a terrible hurricane so they've got something to report. Yeah. But a lot of God's people are standing up and saying, no, yeah. we don't want this, so we pray against it. Yeah. But the point is this. Unexpected storms in our life can happen. Yeah. We didn't expect this turnaround. Yeah. We, we didn't expect this to fall through. Yeah. We, we didn't expect this not to work out. Now that happens. That's life. Yeah. But if we will not allow that thing to bury us and push us under, but rise up and say, Lord, I know this is happening, but I trust you. That's yeah. always waiting yeah. for Hallelujah. Amen. We, we were building a church in Belize, <clears throat> Central America, a number of years ago. And um, <clears throat> they have a rainy season there that's just, it washes everything away. But I started building this not during the rainy season. But as soon as we broke ground, it's back in the jungle, as soon as we broke ground, rain started coming. It was like Noah's day. I'm, I was looking for animals to go up by twos, and I was going to go with them. I mean, it was bad. But not only that, then we finally, the rain stopped, but then we had to keep going back into one of the other villages to get supplies to build the church. And then the bridge washed out. And I'm thinking, what is going on? Bobby Burnett was with Some of you know Bobby. And, and, you know, Bobby has such a funny accent. He said, Brother Lonnie, we got problems. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. We got no bridge. But the water was only about this deep. So we're driving the truck and the Jeep and through it. Everything's going good. And then we finally got the walls up. This, and then we're putting a, a palm thatched roof on it. And then the people of the village got angry. 
We couldn't understand why. We had brought money in. We had done all these wonderful things, a long, long, long thing to, to the story. The property had been given to us by the government. But now the people are angry. And we found out there was a group of people, there was a mixed multitude in that village that were mixed up in voodoo and witchcraft. And now here comes us teaching about Jesus. Well, God did some great things. I won't go through the whole thing. That church is still standing. We built it. But there was a young man there that was 18 years old. No, he was 22 years old. We had prayed for another guy in another location. He was a deaf mute. He had never spoken a word and never heard a sound in his life. We prayed for one in Honduras, the same type of thing. But anyway, we began to pray and say, God, you've got to give us some way to turn this thing around. Well, we were preaching one night. I laid hands on this young man. And when they told me he's deaf and dumb, never spoken a word, never heard a sound, and he wants to be healed. And I'm going, <laughs> oh, well, they need to do somebody else pray for this. <laughs> no. Before I put my hands on him, I command that deaf and dumb spirit to come out. It took a few minutes, but he was hearing. He could hear every word. He couldn't say anything yet because he didn't know what to say. He'd never spoken. But a year later, I'm sorry, about 11 months later, he was speaking perfect Spanish. That we turned that over to, from there saying it's still going, everything is still going wonderful. Yeah. Now see, God will prove himself if we give him a chance to do it. Yeah. Now, let's think, talk about Job for just a couple of minutes before we close here. Everyone reads about Job, poor old Job, you know, Job's comforters. Job lived in fear every day of his life. Mm -hmm. If you read it in scripture, the first chapter, he offered sacrifice every day, an offering to God, because he was afraid his children were going to sin. Long story, the devil broke in, killed his family, destroyed his crops, took away all of his livestock. Everything he had in just a matter of days was gone. Now, some people today, unfortunately, try to relate themselves to Job, saying, I'm going through what Job went through. No, you're not. Mm -hmm. He lost every one of his children. He was the wealthiest man on earth. Yeah. Now, the first thing he did was not a good thing, but he put ashes all over him and wrapped up sackcloth on him, which was a prayer shawl, and he sat down and began to sing, a man is born unto and in trouble all the days of his life. Now, if you be careful what friends you go to or go with when you're going through problems, because yeah. they'll bring you down. And, yeah, I've been through that, man. My grandmother died the same thing. My father had the same thing. You know, he went through that thing three times, yeah. and they'll just bring you right there where they are. <laughs> you ever been there? <laughs> it's not funny, but I'm sorry. It happens. People just... Sometimes it's like you heard Job's comforters. Well, his friends were not comfortable. But one day his wife stood up and said, look, paraphrase here. Job, I've had it. But in less than a year, restoration started in his life because now he's starting to acknowledge his faith in God. He's starting to acknowledge that he trusts God. He's starting to acknowledge that God is who he says he is. See, Job did not resign himself to the situation of trouble that he wasn't going to get out of it, but he realized again who God really is. Yes. Now, the word resign, we talked about this over, the next step is that you detach yourself. The word detach means to disengage. It means to disconnect. See, that happens sometimes in church. Some things can happen to us, and we detach ourselves because we don't know just how to deal with it. Yeah. I say it over and over and over. I've been in church three quarters of my life, 55 years. My God, it tells me, man, I'm old. <laughs> At least I'm not having a 75th um, high school reunion. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Jesus was talking to his disciples one day. Let me hurry here. And metaphorically speaking, he said, eat my flesh. Let well, me do communion. Eat my flesh and drink my blood and you'll have life in you. And there's 70 disciples following you now. And they said, Lord, this is a hard saying. Who can do it? And they walked away from it. 
They disengaged. Now, the 11 or the 12 that he had, including Judas, was still there. But the point is this. These things can cause you to walk away, and I'm not talking to anybody individual. It can cause to happen because it's happened to people over and over and over. This is the season. Now is the time when God is trying to bring restoration to the body of Christ and bring us back, not just to where we were, but better than where we were, and take us beyond what we ever even imagined. Over in Psalms chapter 137, uh, King David wrote these words. And I, I've, I've shared the scripture before. It was actually a song. He said, by the rivers, now listen to this, by the rivers of Babylon, yeah. we sat down. Mm -hmm. Yes, we wept mm -hmm. when we remembered Zion. Mm -hmm. Now what he was saying is, we're crying because we remember how it used to be. Yeah. It ain't going to be like it used to be. Yeah. You hear me? <laughs> Never again. Yeah. That's good news. Yeah. I don't want it like it was. Because he always does greater. Yes. David said we sat down by the rivers of Babylon and we hanged our hearts yeah. on the willow trees. There's an old message that says hanging hearts and weeping. But, and then he said the enemy said to us sing us a song. And he said, how can we as Zion, how can we as the church sing a song in a foreign land? And to the translation, how can we sing when everything is upside down in my life? Yeah. He was remembering the way it used to be and God was, he's faithful. <laughs> He'll always, either him or one of his disciples, will always remind you the way it used to be. And when you think about the way it used to be, then you can't see what it's going to be. Let me hurry on with this. I've only got just a little bit left here. Let me take you back real quick. We talked about Jesus' death and resurrection last Sunday. But the disciples were in a situation with Jesus gone now. It made no sense. Everything he taught us, the miracles every day, the, the, the preparations, everything every day. And now he's gone. What do we do? They, they were heartbroken over this. And, and death had, had just seemed to be so cruel. They, they watched him suffer. And they're saying, this makes no sense. Why would God cause him to suffer for me? So that I wouldn't have to suffer. But remember when he died on the cross? We talked about it, I think, last week. The, the earth shook. And the sun refused to shine. Creation began to groan because of what had just happened. And then the Bible said that they took him off the cross. Joseph of Arimathea put him in his borrowed tomb. Joseph owned it. But like I said, Jesus' body stayed there in the tomb. And the Roman soldiers had put a stone over the cover because they were afraid he was going to get out. They didn't realize the body didn't need to get out. His spirit, went, remember, went into the lower parts of the earth. And as he went into the lower parts of the earth... He told Satan, give me the keys. I take the keys of death and hell back again. You don't have that control anymore. The only control you'll have is what people will give you. Yeah. Now, then he took the keys and he walked, what I told you, he went across what was called paradise, the, the, the gulf to paradise. Remember one of the thieves that said, Lord, remember me today when you go into your kingdom. And Jesus said, you'll be with me today in paradise. So he walked across. And this is true. This is not a a made up story in the Bible or made up to put in the Bible. His spirit, the Bible said, preached to the spirits and captive. See, right now, if I were to die, my body would just fall off. You wouldn't see my spirit. My body would just fall over. Yesterday, my sister's body fell off her body or fell off her spirit. She was gone immediately. The body was left behind. She didn't want to take that body with her for sure. So here's Jesus, and he walks across the gulf to a place called paradise. Another true scripture calls it Abraham's bosom. And he preached to the spirits, and he preached to them. Now, is he screaming and yelling like a Pentecostal? But no, 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 no. He's sharing truth. Yeah. He told them, there's Abraham, who's the father of nations. Abraham, you decided to see my day. Now, here it is. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joel, 
Elisha, Elijah, Ezekiel, well, not Elijah, because Elijah had already gone to heaven. Ezekiel, all these men and the women and the, all the believers that were there had died previously that were believers in Almighty God. He's telling them you're free. Now, I gave you the scripture last week, and I, I want you to see this again. The Bible said at his resurrection in Matthew chapter 27, at his resurrection, there's a reason for this, that the many that were dead rose, the word many there, it translates in Greek to myriad, myriads of those that were dead asleep in the grave, the Bible said they rose up. How could that be? There's some of them dead there 50 years. They're rotting. They didn't do back then what we do today. And they got up. Now, I've heard ministers try to spiritualize this, but there was not spiritualizing to it. It was a natural thing because of what Daniel had said, because of what his ego said. Now, picture this in your mind. Jesus has already come up out of the tomb, and he, he's, he went back by the tomb to get back in his body. As soon as his, his spirit touched that broken, bruised body, he rose up. But at the same time, over in the cemetery, all the people that were believers got up out of their grave. Now, once again, that sounds so far out. But let me tell you, the God we serve is far out. Yeah. He does things that man cannot explain. How could anybody that's been dead like that, how could they rise up and got a new body? We're promised that when he comes back for us. But here are these people, they get up out of their graves, and here they are walking in the streets, and it said they appeared to many. Now, here's my point. What happened to them? Maybe you never thought of that. Maybe you never read it. I don't know. But maybe you never thought, where did these people go? See, God has a purpose with everything that he does. No matter what he does to the enemy to get him off your back, there is a purpose in everything that he's planned and designed. Yeah. Now, where do these people go? Acts chapter 1, and you get into verse 9. Jesus, he's a heavenly body, but he's still in the physical because he walked through doors and they touched him. He walked through doors and they gave him food to eat. Hallelujah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to jump up and down on this. I'm excited about it. It's so real. Yeah. This is what he's doing. But listen to this. He stands there on the mountain, on the bottom. There's 500 people, church members. <laughs> and they're looking at him, and he said, Terry, wait in Jerusalem till you be a dude with powerful and I have on the promise of the Father. And all of a sudden, the clouds, one translation said clouds, plural, no one said clouds, rise up, and he starts ascending upward. We've seen pictures of that. That picture's real. He's starting to go up. And then all 500 are standing there. Wow. we never seen anything like that. they never seen anything like that because nothing like that ever happened. And they're staring, watching him go up in the heavens. And two angels appear and say, hey, guys, <laughs> why are you standing here watching him? That same Jesus that's going away now is going to come again just like he went. He went on clouds. When you read the word cloud, one translation there, one scripture says, have a good, uh, the clouds are the dust of his footprints as he goes through the heavens. But when you read about cloud or clouds, many times it's talking about God's presence. Other times it's talking about his glory. Other times it's talking about people. Now, I, I just want to make sure I get this through. Where did he, these clouds come from? Where did those people that came out of the, did they get buried again in the graves? Now you, you might say, what does it have to do with the problems I'm going through? My point is, he will raise you out of any pit. He will raise you out of any grave the devil's trying to put you in. He will raise you out of any situation and give you life. Yeah. Now, as he's rising up, the clouds are with him. He's on a cloud. But the angel said he's going to come just like he went away. You read it over in the book of Jude. Jude only has one chapter, verse 17. And it said the Lord descends from heaven with ten thousands of his saints. Then we read it over in the book of Matthew and also in Mark that the Lord will come in the clouds. He will come with clouds of glory. The point is this. Many times we don't realize that sometimes... 
How can I put it? Uh, sometimes a situation will appear as a cloud that's covering you. My mind is just so clouded. I just can't think. I can't see. But without realizing it, sometimes the Lord is putting a cloud cover over you to protect you from something the enemy has planned. Well, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> the millennial reign that he's going to bring when he returns to us. I've jumped over a lot of things here. He's trying to get us to the point in this time and this season that we will not let life win. Mm. I mean, the, I'm talking about the negatives of life. We yeah. won't let it win. Yeah. You won't resign to what's going on. You, you won't disengage. Yeah. I remember when I was in the Marine Corps out of boot camp in, in Camp of June and I went into um, infantry training and into, <coughs> excuse me, into them preparing for, for Vietnam. And I remember over and over and over and over and over that, you know, the drill instructor was not a very nice person. <laughs> In fact, many, many times I think he slept with not a gun under his pillow, he slept with a gun. Because he was just, this guy was meaner than, than a junkyard dog. But he was trying to do something to those that he was training. Now, God trains us gentler than that, but he's set to such a point that he doesn't want you to give in to what's going wrong in your life. Yeah. And I remember I was training for recon, and some of the things that they were telling me I was going to have to do, I, I'm thinking in my mind, Mama, man, I shouldn't have joined this place. <laughs> the Army drafted me, and I went stupid and joined the Marine Corps. But anyway, my point, I went through that training, and it put something on the inside of me. I believe my earthly father did some of that to me too, just like yours did to you, Bo. My earthly father put something in me. He was in the Navy. And his thing was, I don't care how bad it gets, don't give up. You're a winner. They didn't know stuff like that 50 years ago. That was not taught back then. You know, there's some of the things that were taught, but he would always tell me, son, if you give up, you'll die in what you're going through. Don't give up, you'll win. You can win over every single circumstance that you ever go through. Yeah. And I realized this, and I, not only did that help me when I was in the Marine Corps, but it's helped me over all these many, many, many years of ministry. I've been deceived, I've been betrayed, I've been robbed, I've been lied on. If I was to able to do, to do everything some people have said against me over the years, I haven't lived long enough yet. But the point is this, none of that matters. Because yeah. <laughs> I know that I know that I know who I am and I know who loves me. Yeah. I talked about this song the other day, but I heard this in my spirit a few days ago again. I don't listen to country music anymore. I, I used to, nothing wrong with it. But you know, even if you don't drink beer, it makes you so sad you want to drink a beer just to cry. And it's, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> But Willie Nelson's song, 20, 25 years ago, you're always on my mind. I heard this this last week, just as clear, not Willie Nelson singing. It was a voice that I'd never heard, just so soft, because I was sulking about something. It was not, nothing bad, something I was dealing with personally. And I heard the Lord sing that to me. And he said, Lonnie, you know what? <laughs> You're always on my mind. You're always on my mind. I said, Lord, you're always on my mind. He said, but no. This, folks, this is true. He said, but no. I want you to know that you're always on my mind. You're always on. And we are. Yes. When he was hanging on the cross, suffering beyond measure, you were on his mind. Yes. You say, he didn't even know me. God the Father did. Yeah. He knew when you would come. He knew when you would be born. And he did this for you. He came and traded places for you. Yeah. And so he's probably singing. If you'll just listen to down, you might hear him sing that yeah. to you. You're on his mind. Yeah. There's a, an old gospel song that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Yeah. And that's the absolute truth. Yeah. Now you that may be watching by social media, maybe you're in a situation today you just don't know what to do. Now I've said a lot of scattered things, but the emphasis is this. God knows what you're going through. He knows what you've been through. He knows what's hurting you. Yeah. And he knows that you think at times it makes no sense. Yeah. He's not angry with you for that. Yeah. He knows it makes no sense to the natural mind. Yeah. But you see, all you got to do is give him a chance. 
Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. It's not difficult. We're not talking about joining the church. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Instantly, he walks in. Yeah. Now, everything may not change in 24 hours or 48 hours, but you'll see it start changing because now you've got God on your side. Yeah. And he'll deliver you and set you free. Maybe you've served him and just kind of got cold because of things. It doesn't matter. Just come back to him. Start where you left off. But maybe you left off in a situation that has caused harm in your life. He'll still pick you up from where you were. And again, just ask him, or just forgive me. Yeah. Come into my heart. And we'll, we'll pray for you. We'll bless you. Now, if you have not, um, if you're not enjoying or connected to a church, you can join us here at 1408. Uh, where are we? Lakewood Drive in Brandon. We don't want you to leave the church you're in. If you're in a Bible believing church, keep going there. We want you to be part of it. But if you're looking for a place, we'd have you come and join us. We have a children's ministry. It's going to grow, get larger and larger. We meet every Sunday afternoon at 1 30. We go online at 2 15. Any need you have, you can go online to our website, even onto our college website.